Tenalis is a truly beautiful game, not just for the surface level story that jumps out from us from an initial playthrough, but also for the desires for comprehension that it leaves within us. A desire that is hard to feed. This brain rot, as it is called, is all-consuming, and while we may flock to video essays, YouTube lore videos, wikis, or forums to find responses to what the truth of the matter is, there really is no correct answer to understanding Signalis. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today, how Signalis truly is a game of no correct answers, and how the search for understanding is in itself a large part of the process of playing the game. Then I'll showcase how these divergent answers paint a beautiful story in its own way. And in doing so, I hope to encourage you to listen more to other theories and interpretations with the hope that you too shall find beauty from these ideals, even if you do not agree with their findings. But with no further delay, let's begin. I think we should first really establish the premise that there is no true correct answers in Signalis. It's quite common for overzealous new players to believe that this simply cannot be the case. Surely there is something that defines a definitive correct answer. Surely the old players in the base simply missed something, a hint or clue that left some rock unturned, and if that search can be completed, then I will be the one to solve it all. The idealism is fair and understandable, for it once grappled me in my own hunt for conclusions that really spurred on my own journey throughout the Signalis War, and likely propelled many of you down the rabbit hole that so resulted in your adoration or understanding of Signalis's war. There is nothing innately wrong with wanting a pure correct answer, and nothing wrong with searching for it, but the issue lies more so in the purest sense that it will never be found. This is not an issue of the community or theorists, but rather a byproduct of the creation that Signalis is. For how in a game that leaves so much ambiguous could we even propose that a solution is purely correct? Hell, by that wager, what does correct even mean in this context? The intention of the devs, the answer that is most logical, the answer which explains the most, or more likely the definition that we are mostly using for in this case, the answer which is most fulfilling. In these cases, perhaps a true response is possible, an answer which fulfills your criteria of pure correct. But what is to say that your criteria is, well, the correct one? Who is to say that the logical answers, for example, are any better or worse than the emotional base theories that so find great connection with the art that they are theorizing in? And further on this extent, upon whose criteria are we defining logic? Is it that reality is real in its purest form, or is it that reality is distorted, or reality doesn't exist at all? These definitions are not universal, and none are greater than the other. And frankly, the way Sinalis is designed, I wager they're not meant to be. Now, I do say this as someone who has his own definition of correctness, someone who has spent months crafting a theory that follows his definition and has culminated in a theory that I hold with pure joy in my heart as the definitive answer to the game to me. The fact is that the answer I find completeness in is only one way to see the puzzle and it holds no greater value and pure weight than the answers of other theorists. For every deep citation and answer I can provide can be countered by literary merit beyond my wildest interpretations from a theory unconnected to evidence. So if no answer is possible, then why do we seek it? Well, of course we seek it, to find resolution and conclusion, to definitively sit back and say, I understand. And there is no harm in that. For those who claim that it is impossible to understand Signalis, I think that is simply silly. Understanding Signalis isn't actually a hard task, to be frank, for the difficulty lies in proving that your understanding is objectively true. This in turn creates an issue for me. As a theorist who's now been here for over a year, I've grappled with ways to fix this age-old problem of endless conflict, a way to calm the masses who will never agree, whose interps all place their soul in completely different claims and ideas, a way to get people who fundamentally can't agree on the basics of the game to find commonality. And I've concluded that's where the issue lies. The problem isn't the search for resolution, but rather the fervor in which we engage to prevent others from reaching resolution. For rather than providing insight and additive help to help build theories to heights such that completeness may be found, we'd rather toss stones at each other, leaving naught but ruins. Why should we all agree when there's no beauty in that? Rather than pretending there is a correct answer or packing theories and ideas into nice neat boxes and debating those boxes to create a world of monochrome theory dominated by right speak and wrong speak, why do we instead try to understand each other? to embrace the differences in theory and paint a rainbow that moves forward. Sure, some theorists that should create ideas will produce ideas 
definitely questionable in merit. But why waste time destroying them and not just building sculptures of value upon the framework they provide? I still find value in ideas like the interp system, but the real point I'm prodding at here is we should open our eyes up, look at the world and its ideas, rather than just staring down at the words we have written before us and defending it as if it were law. By doing this, we might find that our ideas are even more so true to ourselves than we thought before. So the basis of this confusion and the solution that I think is necessary to propose, I'd like to showcase the beauty that interps can provide. The world of theory we can peer into should we let ourselves open our eyes. To grapple with this idea, I'd like to present an example of how varied theories handle Isa. Isa, for those who don't know, is one of the main characters of Signalis, and how each theory handles her presents us with a differing perspective of what is her point in the story. I will never try to tell you what to think, but rather by giving you all these varied perspectives, I believe you will be able to find newfound beauty for yourself regarding what you hold to be true about this character and overall just come to understand and appreciate the writing just a bit more. So I'm now going to explain a bunch of different theories, interpretations of our favorite little gestalt. First, we have Dream Theory's handling of Issa. Dream Theory focuses more on the literary parallels and symbolisms found in a character, and uses that to understand what its role in the story is. For example, in Arion's The Soul Dreamer theories, every single character is simply a connotational representation of a part of Arion's subconscious. This theory may initially draw ire from most, but applying it to Issa we can find a unique portrayal. If Issa is not an individual, but rather a symbol, what is it that she is the symbol of? Easy representations and responses point to her literary roles, the ideals of Arion's lack of connection to her family, for she was removed from the loving care of her mother and ultimately put in a harsh, uncaring environment. In this portrayal, Issa is the sister that Arion never had, a sister who would be willing to support her when she was alone, a sister that ultimately was unable to support her in her times of need. Another portrayal in this same vein portrays her more as Arion's ambition to fight back, ambition to find answers, an ambition to free herself from the tyranny of the society, an ambition that was never realized. But if we want to be a little bit more rational in our theory approach, we can consider ideals where Issa's dream status is literal. Issa is literally a dream representation of her true self, a memory that Arion has from her time on Rotfront of a friend that mattered to her, who has been recreated within the dream to serve as a beacon of familiarity amongst the foreign hostile areas of an ever-worsening nightmare, a beacon which only burns out when hope itself has been lost. Finally, in the context of dreams, what if Issa herself is a dreamer? What if the story is as much about her dream as it is Arion's? How does that restructure the meaning of everything? How does that help us understand the story? While it can completely redefine different parts of Rotfront and different ideas and parallels occurring throughout the story. But we don't have to stick to just dream theories to see unique perspectives on an interesting character. Realist theories offer ideas that Issa is but a ghost, a lost soul trapped within the halls of S23 like all of its other inhabitants, expressing her as a being long gone, much like our protagonist. Or they could state that she was sucked into this nightmare by accident, unwillingly caught in the bioresonance of Arion to be cast into the nightmare that she will never wake from. These ideals cast her character completely different than dream theories, and we can fundamentally change our understanding of her. And it only gets more varied as we look at more and more theories. I only brought up a couple here, but the scale is immense and innumerable. Every single person has a different way of looking at the game and has a different way of understanding Issa. I mean, KIY and literary theories understand Issa from completely different perspectives, seeing her as self-fulfilling prophecies or seeing her as parallels to help us understand the main story. This beauty and, and the point of this entire tirade is this. I'm not going to tell you how to think on this channel, or at least I'm going to try my best not to. I'll never tell you that a set theory is correct or the most proper way, because by doing that, I disrupt a conversation that I like having. When I present a theory, it's just that, a way to put the pieces together. And if my theories help in your understanding, good, that's the goal. They were written to help my own understanding, and hopefully they help your understanding. But if they contrast, fair enough. It is in our disagreement and by hearing each other out that we can ultimately come to a better understanding of more and more of this gem of a game, truly understanding why it impacts us as heavily as it does. So with that, that's all I got. This is all for today. Huge shout out to Molagro and Derek Sai, both have been supporting the channel greatly lately and making videos like this possible. If there's anything I missed, please comment down below. But for now, this has been Christopher Beast, and I hope to see you all 
next time.